looking at you, kid. That's the rumor. Nobody puts baby in a corner. Get away from her, you bitch! I'll have what she's having. You move, Chief. I've been poor my whole life. Not true. I'm going to kill you in one minute, man. It is extremely rude. Funny how. You can't handle the truth! Not, not quite my tempo. Mm -hmm. Is this your homework, Larry? This is necessary of yours. Where I'm from. No fighting. And here we go. Hi, welcome to This Is Reviewable with Braden and Micah, episode four. What's up, everybody? No liquid deaths today, but we do have some things to talk about, don't we? We sure do. Okay. The first thing that we have to talk about is a movie. What's the movie? We watched Airplane for the first time this week. Yeah. Well, you'd already seen it. Yeah, I've seen it before. I, I watched it for the first time this week, I guess. And boy, what a movie. Oh, what a damn movie. What a lovely damn movie. Yeah. <laughs> my me, word. Do you want me to give my synopsis of it? Yes, please. I wrote this out and ahead of time. Awesome. To be prepared. A man tries to win back his stewardess girlfriend by taking a flight to Chicago. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> that's the synopsis well, uh, it's pretty good right yeah but elegant i mean very to the point. okay but also like while on the flight to chicago there's a huge storm and everybody on the plane not everybody and people get sick and chaos ensues so food poisoning hits the plane mm -hmm. through the air yeah yeah that happens. And then the pilots get incapacitated because they ate the wrong food. Mm -hmm. So then the man who's trying to win back his stewardess girlfriend has to fly the plane because he was a pilot in, I think it's an unspecified war. Because I'm pretty sure every time they do his like war flashbacks, they change the footage to be from a different war. Really? I think so. Every single time. Because, like... I mean, that would be on point for them. Because, like, like, the first flashback looks like it's from World War One, and then Seriously? And then one of the flashbacks is literally the Wright brothers, like, trying out their first airplane ever. Oh, yeah. So, so I, think, I think it's, like, it's just part of the big joke that you have no idea what war this guy actually served in. <laughs> But he has, like, PTSD from flying planes, and he hasn't flown a plane since the war. And both of the pilots and the navigator get food poisoning. Mm -hmm. And he has to fly the plane to save everybody. <laughs> yeah. Even though he hasn't wanted to touch a plane since whatever freaking war he was in. Yeah. But, um, yeah, that, that's a good synopsis of it. Do you want to talk about what you liked? Well, who are some of the big names in this movie? There's not really a lot of big names uh, that people would remember. There's one big name that I'm thinking of. Huge. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> You've got such classic actors as Leslie Nielsen. So, weirdly, I didn't realize this, but Jonathan Banks, the guy that plays... Um, what's his name? He's in Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul. He's uh, Gus's right-hand man. What is his name? Oh, Mike. Mike Ehrmantraut. So, yeah, he's in this movie randomly, I, but I didn't pick him out. Um, I don't know who he was. I can't picture who he was, but he's in it, I guess. Okay. And then there's Julie Haggerty, who you've seen from other movies. Like Marriage Story. She's in Marriage Story. Um, Robert Hayes. And Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. <laughs> That's what well, that's bread and butter right there, Kareem. And a foul. I was thinking of. <laughs> yep. Yeah, he's in this movie. He's Played the... by himself. Yeah, he's the co-pilot. Um, Is that the right way to say that? What do you mean? He's in he the plays, movie. Plays, plays himself. himself. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, it's, yeah. Okay, so if you haven't picked up on this already, this is a comedy. So something, this movie is came out in the 80s, uh -huh. right? It's rated PG. Uh -huh. This is not a kid's movie. Not at all. Not at all. Yeah. I don't even know that it should be rated PG. Because there's nudity. Yeah. Yep. There's like a little scene of like, it's not full nudity, but it's 
you know, topless nudity. Yeah. And then... So absurd. There's a lot of racy jokes in this movie. A lot of them. And, like, suicide jokes. There's a lot of that. Yep. One of the things is... um, Okay, something that we're going to try to do better going from now on is we're not going to spoil movies. Yeah, sorry, everybody. Because we have been doing that. Shows are fair game. I'm just kidding. We're going to try not to spoil anything. Unless it's, like, just really ridiculous to not spoil if there's something that we really need to talk about then we'll talk about it but we're gonna try not to spoil anything so anyways this isn't a spoiler really it's just one of the jokes but the the guy that's trying to win his girlfriend back what's his name uh it was ted it was ted yeah that's him are you sure that looks like the guy that has uh the substance abuse problems no, that's him. Oh, okay. Um, so Ted is like a, a talker. He has the gift of gab. And whoever he sits next to on the plane, he's just talking their ear off. And the running one of the running jokes is, at a certain point, all these people decide to commit suicide while he's talking because they just can't take it anymore. So there's very dark humor in this movie is the point. But I thought it worked really well. Well, this is, like, the perfect example of, like, absurd humor, Mm -hmm. I feel like. Because there's one part where this woman is basically having a panic attack. She's having a freak out. Mm -hmm. And the stewardess comes over and starts shaking her. Ma'am, ma'am, I need you to calm down. Slaps her. (laughs) And then, was it a nun next? No, the doctor. Oh, yeah, there's a doctor on the plane comes over. Stewardess, please, I've got this. Starts shaking her even harder. <laughs> Ma'am, calm down. Slaps her twice. <laughs> and then, slapping yeah, her. a nun comes over and goes, Doctor, doctor, please, I got this. Is literally, like, if she was a baby, is baby, like, shaking baby syndrome, you know? Yeah. Slap, slap, slap. And then the camera pans to this huge line of people lined up to try and calm this woman down. There's a guy wearing boxing gloves. There's someone with a gun on the plane. Like a, a lead pipe? Yeah, a pipe, a baseball bat. Yeah. all Just like all these different ways of like what they're going to yeah. hit her with to calm her down. Right. <laughs> and then that lady shows up later and somehow she survived. Yeah, totally all, fine. All of that abuse, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it is absurd. I, I would say that most of the jokes landed in this movie for me. Like that's... I thought it was pretty funny. Yeah. Most of the way through. Um, but I th- that's a good example of absurdist humor. Another example that I put down here is because of the war, Ted has a drinking problem. <laughs> yeah. And it, it shows, it flashes back to where his drinking problem started. And he's holding this cup of juice and he tries to drink it, but he just splashes it in his face. And that's what his drinking problem yeah. is. It, it's like a literal, he can't drink. And so, like, throughout the movie, they reference Ted's drinking problem. And, you know, you think of a drinking problem, he has an alcohol alcohol yeah. abuse issue. Yeah. And every single time, they're like, and Ted's drinking problem. And it cuts to him with, like, trying to just pour this cup of water into his eyes. Or, like, over his head. Or just on his shirt. He just can't hit can't his mouth. Drink. Yeah. <laughs> his motor skills are not there after the war. Whatever war it was. <laughs> Um, so yeah, th- this is a pretty funny movie. I think it's very quotable. Oh, so quotable. That's another thing I wrote down. You've probably seen a meme from this or heard a quote from this. Like, I am serious and don't call me Shirley. <laughs> You've probably heard that before. That comes from Airplane. Um, it's, yeah, it's a classic for a reason. Very memorable in a lot of ways. And I would say also the perfect length for this type of movie i think it, yeah if it was any longer it you know yeah it might have started to out outstay its welcome a little bit but um this is an hour and a half it came out in 1980 by the way so we said that. oh we did okay that's okay but it, it's an hour and a half it's it's short something sweet. i wish tell me if this is well okay so at the beginning of the movie you don't know who exactly you're following, right? Mm-hmm. You're trying to figure it out. And this taxi driver pulls up to the airport, parks his car on the curb, yeah. up on the sidewalk. And this guy 
gets into the cab for a ride Mm -hmm. and the taxi driver hops out of his car and is like i'll just be a minute turns turns on the meter yeah and that's ted yeah ted is the taxi driver runs into the airport buys a ticket yeah gets on the plane with where his girlfriend is because she's like in the process of trying to break up with him and he's trying to win her back yeah the meter is running the whole movie. The whole movie. But the I guy wish does not leave the car. The guy doesn't leave the car. He racks up eleven thousand dollars worth <laughs> of charges halfway through the movie. Yeah. I kind of wish that at the end of the movie they would have showed us yeah. how much he'd actually racked up. Yeah, that would have been funny. Yeah. Eleven thousand dollars. That, that's a nice segue though into what I didn't like about this movie. What? I only have two notes. The first one is there are some pop culture references that are super dated i had no idea what they were talking about like what i can't remember them specifically but like they would compare something to some celebrity like in the hospital remember there's like oh yeah yeah. they make they make some pop culture references that like are gonna go completely over the modern viewer's head and i think I think that that's something that generally I don't like in comedies when they make pop culture references because eventually it's not going to mean anything. So your joke is not going to work. But gratefully, this movie doesn't rely on those. There's only like a couple of them sprinkled in. Yeah. But um, I think I think that you need to... I'm giving advice to filmmakers now. <laughs> Beware of the pop culture references that you're putting in your in your stuff because... Like, especially if it's a joke and the punchline, you need to understand, like, the the reference in order to get the punchline. Like, that's not going to work in 10 years or 15 years or 20 years. So just, uh, you know, I don't like that. I don't like it when movies do that particularly. But again, there weren't that many. Yeah, there weren't that many. Yeah. What else didn't you like? There's one character that I just find completely obnoxious. And he just kind of gets in the way of otherwise really funny scenes. He's in the air traffic control tower. And he's just like overly flamboyant, overly just like a huge goof. And the rest of the movie is goofy. But like the things that he says are just like... And like this character doesn't really fit into like the goofy, absurd parts. I feel like he's the outlier. He's... His jokes are not the same as the other jokes. Yeah, they feel opinion. they feel very different and like very forced. Yeah, and they're and they're just. I wish they could just delete that character out of this movie because he he does nothing um, to enhance the experience at all. Everybody else made me laugh. He did not make me laugh one time. Those, uh, but those were the two complaints I had about this movie. That was pretty much it. Yeah, just examples of jokes that didn't land. But like I said, most of them do. So. What did you not like about this movie? Um, I don't know. I really liked it. Okay. I mean, there are like certain parts that like I kind of wish like weren't there. Like just like the topless nudity. It was just like oh yeah, unnecessary. Unnecessary, but it's also like so absurd because basically everyone yeah. in the plane is in crisis and freaking out and running all over the place, yeah. and then super close to the camera there's all of a sudden this topless woman (laughs) for no reason for no reason stops yeah straight on the camera and then runs away yeah (laughs) first of all there's nowhere to go in a plane where's she going okay then uh who's your favorite character um i mean i really liked ted because he was so stupid yeah (laughs) he's just an idiot (laughs) but Maybe the doctor. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say yeah. too. And he has like a lot of lines and like he's like everywhere because he has to take care of all these sick people and like yeah. he's also like holding down the fort in a way. Yeah. And he's just I don't know. Remember when he's lying to the crew or to the passengers and his nose just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger <laughs> and bigger and bigger. <laughs> Trying yeah. to call, he's trying to keep everybody calm, even though they're in a state of emergency. And <laughs> he's becoming Pinocchio. Yeah, he's the one that's like super literal, like the, like when Ted says, "Surely you can't be serious." He's like, "I am serious," and don't call me Shirley. <laughs> he just doesn't understand, like 
context of conversations. He yeah. just he takes everything as at face value. Yeah. Wait, what was the woman's name? The stewardess? Uh like what was her character name? I'm gonna say Shirley. No. All right. Elaine. That was Elaine. It. Yeah, I feel like she plays the exact same character in like all the movies I've seen her in. I yeah. think it's her voice that does it. Yeah, she gets typecast a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Because she has like this really sweet, nice voice. Yeah. And she's such an angel. But she'll say these things that you're just like, what? <laughs> just like, I'm not going to spoil them, but like inappropriate things with her like tiny little soft voice. Yeah, she's like a sweet old grandma, but she's like in her 20s and she's like already has the voice of a sweet old grandma. Yeah. And then says like <laughs> the craziest thing. Yeah. Yeah, this, this movie, like, it relies a lot on kind of that um, out-of-this-world sort of, like, shock value. Yeah. Not in a gross way, but, like, wh- what? The, there's a there's a Japanese officer that's, like, killing himself with a knife because Ted is talking to himself, <laughs> talking yeah, to him too called? much. Uh, like, like, seppuku or something. Yeah. yeah, he's committing, like, that, the Japanese, like, traditional self-execution yeah. thing. There's a guy that, like, is lighting him. He's about to light himself on fire because he can't listen to Ted talk anymore. It's crazy. Yeah. There's another one we're not mentioning because I. it's so crazy. You just have yeah. to watch it. Yeah. This movie, I'm surprised that it took us, me, uh, like, as a couple, I'm surprised that it took us this long to watch. Yeah. Because this is, like, exactly the type of movie that we love because it's so absurd and it's so quotable. Yeah. Like, we will be talking about this for months. Do you want to rate it? Yeah. Okay. I would rate this like nine autopilots out of ten autopilots. Dang. <laughs> it was good. This So this is the kind of t- comedy that I like, but it's not one that I can watch a lot. Yeah. I feel like. So for that, I don't know. It, it's like, it's a joke a minute. Not all of it lands for me, but most of it lands. So... For that reason, for those reasons, I'm going to give it a seven. A seven? Yeah. That's lower than I would have thought. Yeah. Seven what? Kareem Abdul-Jabbar is out of ten. That was so funny. Yeah. But, oh, oh, sorry. Keep going. But yeah, I, I, I feel like that's, for me, like, again, like, I don't, I'm not, I don't love this comedy. It's not the kind of comedy that I love. It's the kind of comedy that I like. I just said we love this. I know. So you're you calling me a liar? You should have checked with me before okay. you said that. Yeah. Okay, so I love this. Yeah, Michael loves it. I think it's I hilarious. like it. I like I think it's strong. I think it's really good. But I will agree with Braden that, you know, this isn't the type of stuff that we want to watch all the time, but I still love it. Yeah. It's so funny. And I think like the minus one, I agree with Braden about that one character. Yeah. If they just removed him, it would be a lot better. And there's just and, like, the pop culture references, and then, like, the nudity was unnecessary. Mm-hmm. But, like, also, like, it is dated. Mm-hmm. And, like, I think that also just takes away a point. All that combined is minus yeah. one for me. One thing, though, that I was a fan of was how they kind of... There's a there's a couple of, like, movie tropes that they make fun of in this in this movie. And it works really well. Like, at the very beginning, they're making fun of Jaws, where the... Where the shark, you know, the oh, shark yeah. fin, you see the shark fin, but da, it's the da, plane. Da, da. Oh, yeah, what is the, do the sound. It's like, da, 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 and it's da, the plane da, da, fin da, 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 going da, da. through the sky, and yeah, it goes it's like back and forth. serpentining through the sky. <laughs> thought that was really good. And then another one is, from those older movies, if you watch, like, Vertigo, um, whenever there's a driving scene, they're, they're very clearly driving in front of a screen. Because it, it just, something just looks unnatural about what, the way that some of those older movies do driving, and this movie does that, but it just like Completely, makes fun of that yeah. because the the guy is driving and then he starts like swerving all over the road. So but, then the background goes all crazy. Yeah, and and like the characters aren't moving at all in their seats as if he's like swerving. It just makes it look totally ridiculous. And then all of a sudden they're being chased by a band of horses in like the Wild West in the background. <laughs> I, I like it when movies like are not too serious. Yeah, they, they make kind of make fun of like tropes that have become popular for their for their time. That's I guess like a sort of pop culture reference for me that worked that really worked because 
if you've seen any of those older movies, like you know exactly what they're making fun of. Yeah. Yeah. Would you say that the Pinocchio reference though was a pop culture reference? No, uh, cause that's like so famous that like the, the ones that I have a problem with are celebrity, like celebrities that were big at the time, you know? But that might work for other people, and like the driving scene might not work for other people, you know. So like, maybe they're just trying to gather all the different audiences by doing that. It's what I would compare it to is, so right now I'm reading um, a book, and it's set in the I don't want to get this wrong. Okay, it's set in the 1870s, and the main character is talking about like presidents and politicians during the 1870s and i have no idea like what they stood for mm. you know what what they believed in at all i don't i can't picture what they look like and she, the public opinion yeah and and she like she makes references to these people that that's what i have a problem with like i can't i don't i don't know what you're saying mm. i don't understand what you're saying so the Pinocchio thing, I feel like Pinocchio is, has been famous throughout history because it was a, it was a fable first, right? Probably. Yeah. And then Disney didn't Disney, come up with that. Yeah. And then Disney made it into a movie and there have recently been like three animated movies about Pinocchio in the last three years. Um, <laughs> everybody knows Pinocchio. So like That's that, fair. that sort of thing works. Jaws is like super famous, although I guess they couldn't have known that at the time how famous it was going to be because it was in the same decade yeah but like that's one that that still works because everybody knows what that is right yeah i don't know it's a little bit of a tricky thing abdul jabbar was in it yeah i'm sure that some people don't know who he is um some of the newer generation maybe have never if they've never been basketball fans they would never have heard of kareem abdul jabbar so i don't know it's kind of a tricky wire to to tight walk but that's how i feel and i'm sticking to it wait what was your seven what out of ten kareem abdul jabbar's welcome yeah you wish that you came up with that didn't you mine was great what was yours again the autopilot (laughs) oh yeah that was really good (laughs) he was really funny uh, yeah, I, we won't spoil that either. No, that you, you need to watch. That you need yourself. to watch, and please message us if you've watched this about the autopilot. Yeah. Because it's crazy. But, yeah, I, I liked this, though. It's definitely... I seven, definitely... seven feels harsh, but I don't really want to give it anything higher. But I did, I did like this, and I do recommend it. But remember, it's not for kids. Oh, this is not for yeah. kids. No. The jokes are too adult. Yeah. And the nudity. and it, it, Kids won't even enjoy it, you know? Yeah. It's one setting, pretty much, the whole movie. Right. Yeah, there's not enough colors. And singing. There's not enough flashing lights. Flashing lights? Yeah. My word. Okay. <clears throat> okay, moving on to books. I read a book. Yay, Brayden! Finally. Woo! Yeah. Finished a book. Well, it took me 28 years, but this is my first book I ever read. We're so proud of you. Should we get your parents on the phone? No. Oh, that's not that kind of moment? No. I'll call them after this for sure, but... Okay. I just want to share this moment oh. with our, our listeners. We've and... all been waiting. Yeah, I finished it. I did it. What book did you finish? Thing. But I didn't read it. I listened to it. That's okay. We already put the... Again, here's the profit, like... When we say we read a book, we listen to the audio book. Most likely. Please don't be a hater. Right. Anyway, the book I read was called Death in Florence. And it was written in 2011 by Paul Strathern. Sounds spooky. It's not. Um, it's a nonfiction, almost like a history book, but, you know, told in a linear story type way, focusing on just sort of this one subject. Um but it details the history. I wrote this down, by the way. So if this sounds rehearsed, it's not rehearsed, but it is written down. It is prepared. Details the history for the Battle of Florence's soul during the Renaissance in the 1400s. It covers the end of the lives of Cosimo and his son Piero de' Medici. Cosimo? Uh-huh. Okay. Then details the life 
policies and patronage of Lorenzo the Magnificent and his son Piero the Sfortunato, which means unfortunate. And then the second bullet point. That's his last name? No, that's his nickname. Loren, uh, Piero the Sfortunato. Piero the Unfortunate. Okay. De Medici. These are both Medicis. Okay. Um, and then the second bullet point says, it discusses their battle with the Dominican monk Savonarola. He's not from the, Domin the Dominican Republic, by the way. Uh, it's just the order of monks that he came from, the Dominican monk. Um, as well as um, Savonarola's battles with the papacy, so the Pope in Rome. Um, yeah, that's what this book is about. Basically, the, the greatest Medici, quote-unquote, and Savonarola and how they interacted with each other and how Lorenzo's death impacted Florence and sort of the power vacuum that it left. And yeah, that's what it's about. Let me tell you what I liked about it, huh? Please do. All right. So uh, I like how nuanced this book is when it deals with the legacy of Lorenzo de' Medici and Savonarola. It doesn't pass judgment on either of them. It discusses the good things they did, the bad things they did, um, the effects that they had on the world that were positive and the effects that they had on the world that were negative. So it's unbiased, so you it, felt like? It feels fair, yeah. Um, it's very detailed. It explained not only what was happening, but why it was happening. So what political influences were going on in the world at the time that may have led to X or Y happening. Um, it, so yeah, lots and lots of detail. If you're interested in this period of history, it's going to teach you a lot of things that you don't already know, probably. Um, some of the things that I learned personally about mostly what, what I learned was mostly about these two men, Lorenzo and Savonarola. That were from the Medici family. Lorenzo was, Savonarola was a monk, okay. a, a, a preacher. Um, so I always sort of looked at the Renaissance in Italy as this amazing time that was, there was, you know, nothing but good happened during the Renaissance. This is when we get all that art and all that interesting literature that comes out of that period. Um, That's still super relevant to today. Yeah, that has been hugely influential in a lot of ways and a lot of ways that people don't even realize. For example, yeah. like Machiavelli was a heavy inspiration for what was written in for, for our government, basically, for the Republic. Machiavelli, the author. Yes, okay. who came out of the Renaissance, okay. out of Florence. Um, Benjamin Franklin was reading Machiavelli while he was a diplomat in, I think he was a diplomat in France. But yeah, like the Renaissance influenced the way that we set up our government in America, the Constitutional Republic. Huh. Crazy. Not a lot yeah. of people know that. But like, but the, the art that was created during that time, hugely influential. Everybody knows David, the Statue of David by Michelangelo. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows the Sistine Chapel. If you showed a picture of the dome in Florence, people would recognize it. Like th that, there were there were architectural marvels, there were artistic marvels, like amazing things coming out of the Renaissance, and a lot of that has to do with Lorenzo de Medici's patronage. He financed a lot of this stuff, so he is almost directly responsible for giving us this art and these advances in architecture. And, you know, he, he's paying money to these philosophers and these artists um, like Machiavelli to, you know, put their stuff down on paper. So we have him to thank for a lot of this stuff. Um, but. Well, I don't want to jump ahead if you have like a whole, but mm -hmm. like, how were they, this might be a dumb question. How are they so wealthy that he could do this? So the Medici is a, uh, they made their fortune a couple of generations back from, okay. from Lorenzo. They're a banking family. They're banking clan. Mm -hmm. And so they accumulated their wealth uh, by providing banking services. So they had branches in many cities throughout Europe. And I think a couple that were not in Europe, but like they, that's how they made their money. So okay. that's, that's why they were rich. But, and was he like the head of the family during this time? He became the head of the family. And that's why he was okay. Yeah. Cause like, was his father 
into like art yes but not as much as lorenzo was um so he did a lot of really great things um there it also talks about a time where napoli was going to invade florence they were they were going to side with someone and invade florence and lorenzo decided to travel by himself to napoli and um, put himself in front of the king of napoli yeah and the king was so impressed by his like bravery and his gumption (laughs) <laughs> that um, he decided to spare Florence. And then Napoli became like a close ally with Florence for the rest of Lorenzo's life. Oh. So he, you know, he saved the city. Um, he brought us a lot of art, brought us a lot of great stuff. But he also was incredibly corrupt. The The whole Medici family. I mean, it makes sense. So the um, Florence was atypically a very democratic city-state. I love democracy. I love the Republic. For the time, they were used to, you know, being able to vote, being able to vote their officials into office who would help. By popular opinion. Right. Okay. So this was, this was like something Florence was famous for and something that people were accustomed to. But Lorenzo basically manipulated the system in a way that he got to choose the policies that were being enacted. He got to choose the people that were being elected to office. He was essentially the ruler of Florence while he was, you know, the head of his family. So and people knew this? Like, like the, the common... educated people did. Okay. Yeah. But like people and like you and me wouldn't have known. Or whatever. Right. Well, I, I think, I think over time people began to realize and sense that the Medici had way too much power. Okay. Um, and, but that's something when I get to Savonarola that I'll talk about, but he embezzled a ton of money um, from the banks, from the banks, from there was something that was set up by the city that was meant to be like a dowry fund for women that didn't have um, a father that could pay a dowry when. Oh, that's awesome. Right. But he embezzled money from it to oh. to finance his lifestyle and to finance like other things that were going on. Basically, whenever there was an emergency that threatened the power that the Medici had over the city they would embezzle as much money as they needed to to solve it so that they could keep power. Jeez. So they did a lot of they did a lot of horrible things. Um they stole a lot of money from a lot of people and it made it made me like think like yes, we have all this amazing art that is a legacy of the Renaissance, but was it worth the cost of ruining those people's lives at the time? Oh yeah, that's interesting. Because they, you know, they did. They ruined a lot of people's lives the way that they sort of kept an iron grip on the city. But we have the works of Michelangelo and Brunelleschi and Da Vinci and Machiavelli from that time period. So he's got a really that's tricky legacy. Really interesting. I've never, yeah, because at yeah. what cost? And then I'll I'll try to go through this quickly because I I feel like I'm taking too much time. No, that's fine. But um, Savonarola was a really interesting figure. They focus really heavily on him. He was the monk? Yes. So he was one of the only loud voices at the time that was critical of the Catholic Church, which it needed to be because the Catholic Church was insanely corrupt during this period. Yeah, but throughout history, that's never gone well. Right. No. Um, And it does not go well for him in the end. Like, eventually, I guess this is... A spoiler, but this is history, you know? Mm-hmm. He was he was hung and burned alive along with the rest of his, like, greatest followers. How does that... They hung him so and So they then... hung him and then they lit the pyre under him while they were still oh, hanging. And why did they do that? Because they wanted to kill him. The Catholic Church wanted to remove him from... And Florence. Florence and the Catholic Church. He eventually becomes sort of the the leader of Florence. He's the spiritual leader of Florence because he becomes so popular. And the government of Florence don't like him at a certain point, And the Pope absolutely hates him. So they both kind of conspire. But didn't you tell me him. that they lit him on fire and burned all of his stuff so that... Yeah, they were so concerned about Savonarola's influence that they... They burned the bodies, but that wasn't good enough because they didn't want anybody to get any relics to start a new church of Savonarola or whatever. So, like, let's say that his arm... Because they didn't want him to be a martyr. Yeah. That, let's say that his arm burns off. 
they didn't want anyone from the crowd to grab his burned off arm and then put it in a crypt somewhere and then create a church based around Savonarola. Like, oh, he lives on, you know, sort of a thing. They were so concerned about that that they burned the bodies completely and then they burned the gallows that they hung them on. Everything burns. And then they scooped up all the ashes, put them into carts, and then dumped all the ashes into the river. So crazy. Yeah. Um, but he was he was a really interesting figure. He was super brave. Um, he was one of the only people willing to criticize the Medici family as well. He wanted monks to return to like the simple spirituality that their order was based on. A lot of them were taking bribes and accepting gifts from the Medici, and he was like, nope. We're not going to do that anymore. We're just going to live simply like we're supposed to. Um, he he was very important in reestablishing the democratic process in Florence. So when Lorenzo dies, Piero takes over, and over Piero the monk. No, Piero Medici. Okay, his, his brother. Lorenzo's son. Okay, sorry, I'm going to keep asking. I'm yeah confused by these names for some reason. Um, okay, but Piero takes over. Eventually, Piero gets exiled from Florence, and Savonarola is the reason that democracy returns to Florence. Is he also the reason that the unfortunate the son gets banished, or no? Not really. No, he he doesn't have much like ability to exile or you know do anything politically like that, apart from. Like his sermons influence the the popular opinion of things, but um, Piero was kicked out by other other forces basically. Um, but anyway, he also apparently he partially inspired Machiavelli's writings about the Republic. Um, Savonarola was a really smart guy. He was a scholar. He wrote down a lot of his philosophy, a lot of his um, his thoughts. So he was influential to a lot of people. Um, some of the bad influences that he had, he was kind of heartless. So when he, he wasn't very comforting to his mother, when their father died, he wasn't very comforting to people that really looked up to him when like relatives of theirs died. So he was, he was kind of like obsessed with being a, a preacher. So you're saying he didn't have a lot of empathy. So he wasn't, yeah, he wasn't that like empathetic of a human. Um, he antagonized Rome a lot. He was like poking that bear a lot and sometimes to the detriment of the city of Florence. Um, at the end he became... For what purpose? Just because he hated how corrupt they were. Okay. Yeah. Um, he became kind of power hungry at the end. Um, one of the things that the book talks about is like he was very, he very much wanted the people of Florence to have political democracy and be able to choose who was representing them. But at the same time, he wanted to impose like moral, moral laws on people. You're not allowed to do this. You're not allowed to do that. And, like what? and it will be like prostitution, gambling, um, that kind of stuff. So he didn't, he understood the contradiction um, because he wanted them to be free to choose over here, but he didn't want them to be free to choose how they lived their lives over there. So, so he, no separation of yeah, church and state. Basically. Um, and his, his preaches, his preachings and his sermons eventually discouraged a lot of the great artists of the time, like Botticelli in what way? and Michelangelo, like before they were making, they were making their art, um, based on like the classical sort of Greek style. Um, but his sermons influenced them to start painting sad, dreary church stuff, mm. you know? So, you know, we, we might've gotten more, more out of those artists than we ended up getting if, if he had not preached the way he'd preached. But overall, I think Savonarola was a good person, was a good man, like in general, I would say. Still a human, flawed. Yeah. But yeah, anyway, I thought this book was fascinating. Um, the The only dislikes I had about it is it was hard to keep track of everything because of how much detail there is, and you experienced that while I was just talking because you're like, wait, who? Yeah. What? <laughs> um, 
I, it, this is a book that probably needs to be read at least twice to have its like totally total intended impact, which is a little bit of a bummer. But how long is this book? Like uh, listening, how long? Is I think it? it's like seventeen hours. Okay, it's yeah. not horrible. No, but um, but yeah. If, does it feel long because there's so much information? I I was kind of riveted by it the whole way through because okay. I'm just I'm interested in the Renaissance, right? So well, I mean, if if you don't if you don't like reading nonfiction books and you don't like reading historical books, like you're probably not gonna like this because that's what this is. But yeah, if you're interested in this period of history, this is great, super good. Um, I have a couple of fun facts. Are you ready? Yeah. This will be more fun. <laughs> It was it all of this was it was right. interesting. Are you ready to have fun? I'm ready to have some fun. Okay, good. So, um, traditional Florentine style of torture called strappato. They would tie your hands behind your back, and then they would lift your arms up with a crank hmm. until you were hanging from the ground, cool. and then they would drop you just until your feet were almost about to touch the ground. So it would dislocate your shoulders. And then they would have a doctor there to like pop them back into place so they could keep going and do it over and over again. Traditional Florentine uh, torture. Horrible, huh? That is horrible. They they did that to Savonarola and all of his monks like a lot Jeez. by the end of this book. Um, second fun fact, Pope Alexander the Sixth was a POS. That's what I have written here. <laughs> he was horrible, horrible guy. Terrible. Worst ever. For any of you that have played Assassin's Creed, that is the Pope in Assassin's Creed 2. Um, the Rodrigo Borgia, I think his name is. But You want to know something that I learned? And maybe you already knew this. Huh. In Spanish, if you say Papa, uh -huh. that's like your dad. Yeah. But if you say Papa... That's the Pope. The Pope. Yeah, it's the same in Italian. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I just found this out the other day. Yeah, the, the, in, the uh, accent on the correct A is very important. Yeah, because I... Yeah found this out for my coworker, and he was like this is the the papa the father and then one of my other spanish or like spanish-speaking co-workers walks by and he goes oh the papa <laughs> oh okay i guess it is the papa yeah, it's the papa <laughs> no not they're the like no <laughs> yeah the other thing is so i found this interesting apparently in world war ii the italians were just freaking worthless like, which is a good thing because they were allied with Hitler. So they their incompetence is part of the reason that we were able to defeat the Nazis, which is good. But um, who, was the, who was the fascist guy? What's his name? Mussolini. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mussolini wanted to, he wanted to take, I think, Romania and then Germany took it. And so he was mad, just a big harumph. And so he was like, fine, I'm going to go take Greece. Goes over to take Greece with an army that's like 10 times bigger than anything the Greeks have. Gets pushed out. <laughs> Bruh. <laughs> loses, loses territory to the Greeks. Just freaking sucks. Oh my god. Hitler's like, okay, can you take care of uh, North Africa? Sends them to North Africa. They get their asses kicked. <laughs> Germany has to take over that front too. So the Italians were just like this sort of all bark and no bite army. That's so funny. In World War Two, and reading this, I'm starting to see maybe why that is. Because like Italians were, it, it says like whenever they had battles, they would hire mercenaries to fight the battles. Okay. And then what would happen is the battle would start. Mercenaries from Italy. Yeah. Okay. The battle would start, and then maybe a couple of people would die, and then one side would be like, "Whoa, whoa, whoa! We're not actually killing here. We're gonna <laughs> surrender and retreat." And then the other side would be like, yeah, that's that's okay. You go ahead and retreat. Go ahead. Bye. And that's how they fought their battles. So they were just just a bunch of little biz. weak warriors. Yeah. And when France invades at a certain point in this book, they're like, whoa, hey, whoa. <laughs> You're not actually supposed to kill us. You're not actually supposed to fight in a war. What are you doing? That's so funny. So it's starting to make sense why Italians are such little weaklings. It's when like it when you're a to... little... And you uh, are fighting with your sibling. And yeah. then like, one of them actually hits you. And you're like, whoa, we were just playing. That's the Italian military in the Renaissance and at least up to World War II. Jeez. So, yeah, they, they definitely are not Romans at so this point. Do you think, like, this is kind of where, like, the mafia started? Or is, like, yeah. the it, idea of, like, the Medici family? 
it, it's like very Being corrupt. It's very much a parallel to that, I would say. Because, like, at what point, like, around when, like, did the mafia become super big in Italy? I don't know. I have a book on my reading list that Talks is, is going to go over the Camorra. It's about the Camorra. I'm just not reading it until after Italy. we travel to Italy because I don't want to be worried when we're in Napoli. Thank you. So I figured you'd appreciate that. Yes. Anyways, um, Parents Guide, real quick. It's suitable for any age. It's just dense. So younger listeners just might not be interested in it. But I'm going to give it nine little friars out of ten. That's hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> that was his nickname, Savonarola, the little friar. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. That's it. Sorry that took so long. No. Yeah. Do you have a, a video game to talk about? I believe. Okay. So I played a video game this week and it was No you didn't. Really short. No, it wasn't. I'm gonna smack you. Have you ever seen that Monty Python skit where it's like an argument? He goes in to have an argument. No, it's not. Yes it is. No, it isn't. This is an argument. No, it isn't. Yes it is. No, it isn't. Yes it is. <laughs> That's not arguing. You're just taking a contrary perspective. Yes, it is. What is it? This is an argument. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, the game is called Inside. And as I understood it, it's basically this boy trying to escape capture death. Okay. And mind control. Okay. As I understood it. Yeah. I basically the game starts off this boy is out in the wilderness and he's trying to evade these people with guns in trucks and dogs and dogs that will ki- kill him if they kill you it just resets to like the checkpoint or whatever and yeah. it chooses where the checkpoint is but he's like running away and then eventually he gets into like buildings and has to escape the same military people basically and then eventually makes his way into like labs don't spoil it and has to evade scientists and all this but it's like a very monochromatic game except for this boy wears a red shirt it looks really cool i think i think it's really scary yeah i was really scared but the art design looks really good yeah in my opinion yeah and and there, there should be some footage that you you'll see. Oh yeah, if in you the watch, YouTube version of yeah. this. Of if this you want to see what it looks like, down. you can go on to our YouTube video yeah. and check it out. We'll record some footage of but, Micah playing out. Yeah, this. I mean the game was really short. I think I looked up like online like other people's average playtime, mm-hmm. and it was like three hours to four and a half hours. Yeah. And there really is short. like, is this a spoiler? Like an alternate ending? I just don't talk about the ending. No, well, there is an alternate ending. I only found out about it because I looked it up. Okay. My opinion, the ending is confusing. Okay. The alternate (laughs) ending, even more confusing. I don't understand it. Definitely play it because it's fun. I mean, there's only... The controls are very simple. You move back and forth. You can jump and you can grab onto things. And those are all the controls. You don't gain any extra skills. Well... It's a puzzle. It's a puzzle game, right? Yeah. Yeah. So you're just trying to like fall, um, figure out these different puzzles or evade, you know, and like you're running away and then you trip over something and they catch you and they kill you. Yeah. Like, okay. So I need to jump over that like sequence stuff. And there's like swimming or whatever. It was creepy. There's this thing in the game. I looked it up and they call her the girl. I guess she's like a siren or something. In the water. In the water. And her hair is super long and she doesn't have a face and she like kills you. Yeah. So scary. It was freaking me out. And like the dogs tear your body apart. This isn't a super gruesome game though. No. It's not. It just, it's, I'm sensitive and this freaked me out. It doesn't look photorealistic. No. It, it's just like, it's a 2D side scroller that uses a lot of shadow and it uses a lot of contrast between dark colors yeah. and light colors. Yeah. So it doesn't look super real, but it looks really good. Yeah. Um, so I looked up like some of the different meanings for the game. Okay. Let's hear them. Is this a spoiler? Now I'm worried about it. I don't think so. Like, as long as you don't disclose anything that happens in the game. Yeah, just, yeah, talk about it. So, 
I looked up some of the different meanings because I just thought that this kid was trying to avoid mind control. Mm -hmm. One of the people online said he thought that this kid is trying to like rescue his parents that have been mind controlled. Mm. But then he's like, there's no evidence to show that. So I don't think so. But it's online. So it's probably true. Exactly. Okay. And then someone else was like, this is to symbolize cancer. And this kid is like a benign tumor moving through a host. What? Undetected. I don't know. Was that also online? All of this is online. Wait, okay, so maybe that one's true. Yeah. Oh, oh boy. I know. Um, I also read online Uh that this could be symbolizing how video games take over your life. Huh. Ironic. Yeah. Why, you know, why... If you think that's a problem, why why create a video game to I don't relay know. that message? I guess like that, you know, if they play it, okay. I guess I could see it because they know they know that Are you being ironic, right? No, now? no, they okay. know that a gamer is going to play this game, and that maybe that's the only way that he'll get the message. Yeah. So maybe that's I don't know. But this game is like a set in like a dystopia, yeah, setting or whatever. Right, modern day San Francisco. I think it was, right? <laughs> Who told you that? Or Seattle. Did you read that online? <laughs> no. But I could post it online and it'll become true. <laughs> so, and like, I don't think the game developers ever released, like, what is... And like, the ending doesn't give you any answers. The yeah. ending left me more confused. Yeah. It's one of those games that you're supposed to debate about. Yeah. And Which, ponder, like, I don't mind. ponder the meaning. Yeah. But that's what sent me online after ending, like finishing it to find out that there was a second ending, which didn't help with any answers, which is probably the point. But yeah, I don't know. But I liked it. It wasn't too hard. The only thing was it was spooky. So like, you know, parents warning. It's a little spooky for your kids. It's not horrible. You know, it's not like these first person shooters that are super gory. It's right. just a little scary. But I think I would rate this seven blobs out of ten blobs. Okay. Should I give it a different I, name? I thought you were going to go higher for some reason. No. I think I would have liked it to be longer. I think I am sensitive to like violence and some of those dogs yeah. really scared me in the way that they kill you. Yeah. But... I'm just confused. Yeah. You know? Okay. I don't know. Seven blobs. Seven blobs it is. Yeah. Did you watch anything this week? Yeah. Yeah, I did. What did um, you watch? Oh, you know what? I don't think I ever wrote down what my rating of this was going to be, but I think I have an idea. I watched uh, Brawl in Cell Block 99. This is a 2017 movie, and I'll read you the summary real quick that I wrote. A man gets laid off and then starts moving drugs for an old friend to support his wife and the baby they're trying to have. He ends up on a job that goes wrong and goes to prison. In prison, he's given an ultimatum. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah. When I told Micah I was watching this movie, she asked what movie I was watching, and I said, Brawl in Cell Block 99. She was like, that sounds really violent. And is it just one fight? And it is. The whole two hours is just one fight? No, it's actually not an action-packed movie believe it or not um it's more of a slow burn where it builds up to the fights that happen in prison and i had always heard that this movie was pretty rough like hard to watch because of violence yep and um for the first like two acts i was like "Eh, no this is fine like this isn't that bad and then that third act happens and i was like oh my gosh Oh, I'm cringing. Oh, oh my gosh. Uh, Oh, I have to look away. (laughs) Um, Yeah, so people weren't lying, really. Let me tell you what I liked about it, though. So the first two acts are extremely realistic and raw. Um, So like... In what way? It's like nothing is overly dramatic. Like when they run into... When the job goes bad, that drug job that gets him in into prison i don't consider this a spoiler because you know he ends up in prison from the name right when it happens in what like the first 20 minutes no like maybe like the first half hour or so okay but yeah i guess 
that's pretty close to the first half hour. But anyway, like they, they get into this gunfight with cops um, or a gunfight happens between cops and drug people and grenades go off at, at one point, but there's no explosion. Like there's no big fireball. It just like, it feels like how an actual, how you would imagine an actual grenade feels. Which is what? Just like really powerful sound, you know, sort of shrapnel going everywhere, but there, it's not like a big fireball. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So like, it feels really real, like the, the action that's going on. Um, it's really well shot. Like it's uh, it's very sort of intimate. It's, it puts you, the main actor, by the way, is Vince Vaughn. It puts you in Vince Vaughn. I know. Right. So this is another positive that I took from the movie and I have this written down. Vince Vaughn is a great actor. Double question mark. Yeah. What? Yeah. I didn't realize it. Like I've seen him in comedies and I thought he was good in comedies, but he's, he's really good in this, like in a dramatic role. I was kind of surprised by I'm that. I'm speechless. Yeah. The other thing I liked about it, so, I mean, it's a very simple story, but it's a very personal story about a man who's trying his best to do what he feels is right. And he gets sucked into a world that he doesn't really want to be a part of, but you find out when he's put into those situations, he's kind of an animal. And it really reminded me of Drive in that way. Mm. Um I will talk about Drive in a... I think I'm going to do a special video about it. Because you love it um, so much. Because I think Drive is awesome. But Drive came out in 2015, and it's Ryan Gosling as a we getaway love. driver. I'm sure people have seen, like, pictures from that movie or meme. Like, for some reason, that movie's become kind of memeable recently. But he's, memeable. he's like, wearing, like, the scorpion jacket. People People might recognize the scorpion jacket. I thought that this parallel drive in a lot of ways, um, it's, it's a slow burn, just like drive is it's really well shot, just like drive is, but then it explodes into scenes of extreme violence, just like drive does. And both characters are sort of these people that want to be better. They want to be better people than they are, but they have this, they have a part of their nature. That's just really aggressive. Mm and really violent. Um, and that is reflected in both of these movies. Another thing, well, I'll get to that actually in a, in a second. Some of the things I didn't like about it. Um, I don't think this is a negative for me, but it is something I want to disclose. Um, it is a slow moving movie. Um, how long just is it? the nature of it? I, Oh, that's a good question. I'll look it up two hours and 12 minutes. I guess it's not super long. I think Sometimes for, when it's slow moving, you feel every it minute long. of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, also, after he gets laid off, I don't think the passage of time is handled particularly well. So he he gets laid off, comes home, finds out his wife has been cheating on him, freaks out, but he doesn't hurt her. He just beats up her car because he wants to get it out of his system. Mm -hmm. um, and then he comes in and he's like, "Let's talk." You know, they figure out their differences and they decide they're going to try to have a kid again because that solves all issues in this case they really love each other they just kind of lost communication so it was okay i don't know uh, okay. but anyway like it jumps forward in time and you're like wait so has he started running drugs already or what's going on uh, and, then, and then he comes home to his house and it's really big all of a sudden and his wife is like nine months pregnant you're like oh okay so so we just jumped way far into the future. So that's just how they showed the passage of time is basically his wife being pregnant. One scene and then the next scene, basically. Mm -hmm. So I didn't think that was handled particularly like well. Like they should have put like a, uh, what's it yeah. called, a montage or something of him running drugs. I don't know. I don't know what I would do to change it. it I was just like confused for that 10 minutes or so until I mean, he gets home. They could have just even put like words nine right. months later, one year later. Right. At a certain point, the main character makes a decision that does not feel like something he would do because to this point, he's been very careful. He wants to protect the people he cares about and he's been very careful about doing that. Yeah. But he makes a decision that feels extremely rash and extremely risky. No! It's too risky. It's too risky. And I did not think that sounded like it, it didn't seem like something that the character that I'd been watching would do. 
So I didn't, I didn't love that. And then why do you think they did that just to move the story forward to get from point A to point B? Yes. Um, and then the last thing I put was it's too violent for my taste. Wait, sorry. Back to the other. Do you feel like they didn't give enough motivation for him? Like as a viewer, you were like, what was the motivation? No, I understand why I understand why he did it. Like I just felt like it was out of character. I just felt like it, it didn't feel measured like the rest of the decisions that he'd been making up to that point. Okay. Um, but yeah, this, this movie is freaking ridiculously violent. The scenes where the violence happens are like, wow, yikes. Like I said, I was kind of cringing. Mm. I would say, and this is crazy for me to say, I would say watch drive first. And if you can handle drive, then you can probably handle brawl and cell block 99. But like for, well, for the longest time, I would tell people like, yeah, I don't know if you should watch Drive because it's like when it's violent, it's freaking violent. But now I'm sort of treating it like it's an appetizer to Brawl and Cell Block 99 in terms of like what you can handle. So are you saying, okay, so you're just saying if you can handle this, you can handle that. You're not saying watch this as a warm up to get you prepared for. That's sort of what I'm saying. Like Which one? Drive. No, I'm confused. I just asked you two different questions. No. I said yes to the second question okay. and then watch Drive. Okay. Yeah. Because, like, for me, I'm super sensitive to violence. Yeah, you shouldn't. And I wouldn't watch either of these. But, like, someone that's a step above me, mm-hmm. you're saying watch Drive to understand how violent it yep. is and to prepare you for yep. how violent th- Okay. Yep. So you're encouraging them to watch what things I'm sa- outside of their comfort zone. What I'm saying what is, saying? <laughs> what I'm saying is, I'm shocked that, but this is actually worse than Drive okay. when it shows, when it shows the violence. Okay. Um, little fun fact that I wanted to point out: um, in Drive, like I said, the man wears a scorpion jacket, and that's a big uh, sort of crucial theme in the movie: the story of the scorpion and the frog, where the frog takes the scorpion across the river. Um, I'll talk about that when I talk about drive, but there are a lot of shots in that movie where it's just Ryan Gosling's back to the camera and his back takes up pretty much the whole frame and it's focused on the scorpion. So you're supposed to be, your eye is supposed to be drawn to the scorpion in brawl and cell block 99. There's a lot of shots like that of the back of Vince Vaughn's head. And he's got this like cross tattoo on the back of his neck. So it really reminded me of drive in those parts. Cause it's like, you know, focusing on something that may be an important metaphor. Is it? I think so. I think it's like, you know, he's a man that has principles and he has things he cares about the cross. Right. But the cross is also like a symbol of violence. That's the way that Romans used to execute people. And obviously famously Jesus was executed on a cross. So it's sort of like a contrast between who he wants to be and who he is. That's how I saw it. That's interesting. Um, so I thought that was really cool. Yeah. Parents guide. I wrote, Ooh, we don't let your kids watch this. Say it how you would say it though. Ooh, we <laughs> don't let your kids watch this. Ooh, we. <laughs> um, yeah, it starts out not that bad, but once the prison fights start happening, big yikers, dude, big yikers. There's some swearing, not that much, no nudity, but yeah, this violent is violent as hell but um i would rate this i would rate it probably a seven big bald heads out of ten i high i know i loved i loved the slowness of the beginning i was very impressed by vince vaughn i thought the story was effective um i was happy the way that everything got resolved i really liked i love drive again so a movie that imitates it in a competent way like i'm gonna probably like that movie but it loses it loses me a little bit on how graphic it is what did you watch i watched this show it only has one season it's called special ops lioness oh this is the taylor sheridan show is that the director uh he's the guy that did um yellowstone oh yeah this is much better okay in my opinion. Um, so basically this show is about, well, okay. Here's some of the main characters. 
So there's Joe. I don't know what her rank is, but she's the captain of this task force. Okay. And there's Cruz, who's a Marine and gets enlisted into this task force to help with this operation that they have. Um, there's this woman called Aaliyah, and she's the daughter of a terrorist. Also, Nicole Kidman is in this show. Oh, your favorite. Oh, she actually didn't freak me out that much in this. Anyways, so they work for the CIA, this task force. And on the top of their the CIA, CIA kill list is this terrorist out in the Middle East who basically uh, supplies a huge amount of the oil to the world. He, and then has so much money. They're like, he's literally like the richest person in the world, but he's a terrible person. And at one point during the show, um, Cruz, who is the undercover operative for this um, mission, they're flying somewhere and she is told that she needs to watch um, footage of all these terrorist attacks that this oil guy has is the cause of. And she watches eight hours of footage. Mm -hmm. And they're like, this isn't even, this is just a fraction of the stuff that he's done or caused. And so basically Cruz, the show starts and she is living in this house with her boyfriend. She works at a burger joint. Um, it's pretty obvious that the people she's with are not good people. Um, the girls living in the house. Why? Because just because they have tattoos, that's very insensitive. Did you watch the show? No, <laughs> no. Um, the girls in the house are strippers and they apparently Cruz used to be a stripper. And so all the girls, everyone in the house is like, you're such a loser for working at this burger joint. You should be a stripper. You should me. be a stripper yeah. because the girl in the house made like 500 bucks in one night and Cruz made a hundred bucks or something like yeah. that. And probably not even that 80 bucks or something like that. And she gets into an argument with this girl and her boyfriend ends up hitting her. So then the next day, wait, she, what oh, hits Cruz hits Cruz, whose boyfriend, her boyfriend, okay. Cruz's boyfriend who lives at the house. It, it's all these couples living at the house. Okay. So it's like the bachelor. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Cruz gets into this argument with another girl that's living in the house, another girlfriend. Okay. And Cruz's boyfriend gets in the middle and Cruz is basically like mouthing off to her boyfriend and her boyfriend punches her in the face oh. and she goes and cries herself to sleep the next morning, gets up, tries to leave. An altercation happens. Cruz runs away and makes her way into a Marine recruiting office and ends up going into the Marines because they saved her from this situation. Um, she ends up, Going through all that, spends to, they don't show the passage of how long she's been a Marine very well, in my opinion, because at some point during the show, she talks about how she did a tour out in, I can't remember the country, probably Afghanistan or something. Mm -hmm. And it seems like she's a complete rookie, basically, like into a recruit, but apparently she's gone on tour. So I don't think they did that very well, but she is recruited into operation or special ops lioness and she's gonna go undercover to befriend the terrorist's daughter mm -hmm. who is going to get, be getting married soon and there's a lot of like moral conflict that comes with her befriending this girl because mm -hmm. cruz thinks that they're really friends and that they have a relationship mm -hmm. and joe the leader of the task force is basically like this is your job you need to pull it together and there are other side stories of Joe. Joe has a family and like lives at home, but then all of a sudden it's gone because she has uh, an op she has to do. And then a couple days later is home and uh, that has to be really hard on their kids and stuff. Yeah. Nicole Kidman actually didn't really freak me out. Maybe because they put some color in her face. I don't know. So she wasn't just a pale ghost. Yeah. With red hair. She wasn't a taxidermist either. 
Yeah. <laughs> um, I'll be curious to see like if they do a second season because there's not a whole lot. I felt like it was resolved at the end. But I feel like they it was a good show, it was very well made and like the acting was good. So like I would think money wise they would want to make a second season, but I don't know what it would be about. I wouldn't hold your breath though, because I no. just heard that Taylor Sheridan is doing another new show. Oh, okay. So he's that's fine. He's just doing too much, I think. <laughs> that's besides the point. Okay. So parents guide, whatever is there is sex in this. And it's not like a PG-13 sex that's more showing of that. And there is a lot of language and there is violence. It's not over the top, but there is violence. Mm -hmm. Um, I think I would rate this 7.5 CIAs out of 10. Cool. Yeah. When does the lioness show up? I'm not going to spoil it. Is it Nala? From the Lion King, or is it a different lioness? I thought we weren't going to spoil things. But, I mean, before I watch something, I need to know how much, you know, how much Nala is in that thing, or how much Donkey Kong is in that thing. Otherwise, if there's no Nala and no Donkey Kong, <laughs> I'm not watching that thing, okay? So maybe when we turn off the microphone, you can tell me when Nala shows up. Okay. Okay. Well, that was it, I think, right? Yeah. For this week? Yeah. Uh, ne- next week, what do you think? Should we watch Shorzy? Uh, yeah, I think that might be a good time to finish Shorzy. Okay, yeah. So by this time next week, we will have finished Shorzy. Probably. This is pretty much a promise. Most likely. Yeah. Okay, well, thanks everybody. All this, right. This was reviewable. <laughs>